this is gonna be fun, right? This is <laughs> the entire world together here. Um, España, Luis León, un gran amigo, Santiago Encinas Chile, from Peru. Uh, Hi everybody. Uh, so we are we're getting ready. We we have an amazing team here. Uh, if I Argentina, so this is gonna be fun, right? This is. <laughs> España, Perú, Argentina, Chile, Punta Arenas. Arenas. Yes, a lot of people yeah. from from every every everywhere. Uh, Uruguay, Ivo. Muchos de Uruguay no. Not yet. <laughs> Let's see. Oh, Daniel Scorsetti también, gran amigo. So there's going to be a lot of people here. Uh, we're going to share a lot of knowledge, a lot of tools, a lot of the experience for IR Group from Opti. I think, um, and we, we really want to make it interactive. We're going to be there to answer your questions. We always tell people, you know, to follow up in social media because it's a direct channel to be in touch, especially the YouTube channel. As you can see, here um if you subscribe you can you, you will be able to have access to this talk again and many other talks we have done talks with jonathan lake amazing talks with takashi too mastering cataract surgery so if you want to go back to those talks and, and see them there all of them are in the youtube channel there's a lot of people always asking um asking us about it uh, a little bit about us we are uh, an open platform, an ecosystem for ophthalmology from people from everywhere, as you can see. Uh, you know, Takashi, Jonathan are great uh, members from Brazil. I'm from Uruguay, living in Mexico City. Andres, Lisandro from Argentina. So there is a lot of people um, sharing knowledge, sharing skills. This is basically the main objective of, of this platform. And today is gonna to be a perfect example of that. Uh, Evidence-based medicine is, as you can see there, everything for us. Uh, we're gonna talk a lot about uh, data and experience, but also with evidence-based medicine behind it. Um, in today, our main objective is is not is is give you you know information of good quality and then you to make your own decisions. This is very important for us too today. Um, we're gonna share a lot of information and then the key here is gonna be to, you know, to grab uh, information for maybe a big chain like IRI and, and just bring it back you know, to your, maybe your small practice. I think there's a lot of patterns that we can uh, learn from them. Uh, just quick note, tomorrow morning, we're gonna be right here. He's with us, Jonathan and Ben Lahoud from New Zealand, 8 a.m. in the morning talking about FACO, something that we really love, so we expect you there. Uh, on Friday, we're gonna have a virtual live surgery. There's something that we're doing a lot. Uh, and tomorrow, for you to understand what, how our organization works, today we're gonna have an amazing thing. This is in Spanish because it's gonna be in Spanish, but we have something called the empty chair, la silla vacía. So today, what we have, is we have a lot of people who are giving us ideas. And before we start, we make a vote. And you know, the people who are voted are the one who speaks. So this is a really open platform. To, tomorrow we're really happy and waiting for it. And on Friday, for the other, you know, for you to understand how, how this works, we have an amazing team from all over the world talking about gonioscopy. This is, if you don't speak Spanish, you, you should learn it before Friday because this is going to be this is going to be history is going to be very very good actually the the Council of Ophthalmology in Mexico told us today that they're going to give points for people who assist así que los que asistan el viernes eh, es una novedad de último momento van a tener puntos del Consejo Mexicano o sea que la verdad que el viernes nadie se puede perder su lugar so for me, it's an honor. Let's, let's stop sharing the screen and, and we can see everybody here. Again, we have people, you know, we have the Optalma University team. We have the IRI team. Um, 
we, we have the Opti team from Brazil, Andres, Lisandro, no sé si quieren también decir algunas palabras, and so we can start right on time with this uh, amazing webinar because it's going to be very helpful for everybody. Just something quick, Ivo, I just want to say thanks. Takashi, Jonathan, Amaury, IRI, uh, the, the, this hospital, thank you so much for this opportunity. It's a honor for us. So let's see why, how we can learn about you guys because you have a lot of experience. So let's enjoy this meeting. So for everybody to understand a little bit, a little bit how it's gonna work is we're gonna have the IR team for the first 25 minutes talking about their experience, about everything they learned in the past months. They, they, they're ahead of us. So again, have an open mind and learn everything from them. If you have any questions, please ask them on the Q&A or in the chat. And we're gonna try to, you know, to do a dialogue with them. So please to the IR group, we, I, ask, I ask them to start sharing their screen and their presentation. Then we're gonna have the Opti team. You know, we're gonna present them, but we have Amari Guerrero. He's the CEO of this group and Jonathan and Takashi are members of this group. And they're gonna share a lot of knowledge as well. So please, uh, for the IR group. Okay, yeah. so I can't, uh, okay. Hello everyone. I'm Shen from IR, IRI Hospital Group. First of all, it's our great honor to have all you here. And thanks to Dr. Takashi and Dr. Ivo for Having this webinar. So before the, the, the sorry starts, I think there are many people in the need to give you a brief introduction of our group. So I prepared a, a, a presentation to walk through. Uh, uh, but first, I would like to introduce the development history of IR Group. IR brand was established in 2002, and the first wholly owned IR hospital was, found, was founded in the same year. And the IR Group was being listed in Shenzhen Stock Exchange in 2009. And in 2016, IR Group began overseas. First acquired IR Hong Kong and IR US. And then in 2017, IR became the start IR provider in the world through uh, through the acquisition of Gringa Baviera, which is the eye service leader in Europe. And in 2018, I entered the uh, Southeast Asian market. Acquiring... Uh, is that OK? Everybody, can, it's okay. okay. Everybody can see the presentation. Yes, thank you. And uh, okay. And the IR is also the first and the only China main board listed healthcare provider and the founder of the first medical school of ophthalmology in China. Uh, and these are these are some of the most important words of IR, like the top ten most reputable listed company award in China, the first and the only famous China Chinese trademark of eye care provider in, in China. And this page shows IR's culture. And you can see our mission is enabling everyone, whether rich or poor, has the right to enjoy eye health. And this is the global layout of our group. At present, we have more than 500 eye hospitals in, in China, include the seven uh, optometry centers in Hong Kong and the 86 clinics in Europe, respectively in Spain, uh, Italy, Germany, and Austria, and one eye, eye center in the United States and 12 clinics in Southeast Asia. So now we operate in total more than 600 eye hospitals uh, in the world covering three continents. And we have three listed companies respectively in China, Singapore, and the Europe. And we have more than 36,000 employees worldwide, 
and the number of ophthalmologists and optometrists is around 7,400. Uh, 7, and this is the footprint in mainland China of our hospital. As of the last month, we have 512 uh, hospitals in the mainland China. And this is our global presence, our uh, families. And the last year, we founded a new company called uh, IR Global Vision Care Management Company in Hong Kong, which is a platform targeting to pool and leverage vision related resources and the Thailand, Thailand uh, through partnership, which is translates integrated expertise and the technology into tailor made consulting service and the training program with the IR Global Network. And this chart outlines our three public companies performance in the stock market. And as you can see, we are doing very well in the capital market. And you can see uh, IR's market capitalization is uh, like is around 18.7 billion USD dollars. And we also, at the same time, we, uh, our group also pay pays uh, great attention to personal training, scientific and academic research, and has done a lot of work in these areas. So we, we you can see we have IR School of Ophthalmology, Central South University for master and doctoral degree, and the IR School of Optometry, Hubei University of Science and Technology for bachelor degree. And we also have IR Eye Research Institute, which is co-established with Wuhan University to realize IR clinical research ability improvement, plus the building of research-oriented hospital and the transformation of scientific research uh, achievement. And to gather innovative resources, for some scientific research transformation, and to enhance overall medical technology, I established seven institutes covering the following uh, subspecialties like uh, optometry, retina, glaucoma, refractive, and cataract. And we also have two workstations for academic research. And uh, in IR, we also provide surgeon training and residency training. Uh, the trainees will get a certificate and a qualification, a qualification issued by the government and the National Health Commission. We also cooperate with Chinese Ministry of Science and Technology to undertake international workshop on cataract prevention and treatment uh, for those uh, students from developing countries. And this, that's all my sharing. And I will uh, hand it to our medical quality control team. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Tianjiang, now, next, I'll give you. You come. Okay. I first talk about that. Ah, ah, can, can. Ah, okay, okay. Ah, 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 okay. Ah, 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 uh, Chen Xu from Shanghai, I will share my experience uh, with uh, COVID-9. Uh, it's, uh, it's been my honor to be here by uh, Takasi Inventing to join this meeting. Uh, everybody can see my screen, it's okay? Yes. Yes, uh, I will share uh, some experience of Shanghai Area Hospital in COVID-9. Uh, everyone know in the last, uh, in the, the uh, later June, so Wuhan was locked down from the uh, COVID disease. This is uh, the Wuhan city view. Uh, you can see nobody is uh, on the street. It's, uh, the city is closed, but in Shanghai Area Hospital also closed, but it's for the one week uh, during, um, uh, due to the China traditional national year. So uh, uh, we plan to reopen after one week's vacation, but uh, the government uh, asked me still closure for the COVID-19 in February. So one or oh, four months, all the staff may be stay at home, but uh, we'll have lunch in many webinar about the uh, great practice and the management uh, uh, every day, like uh, the everybody uh, joins this uh, webinar meeting from here. 
So um, after one month close uh, in the early March, the hopes better is reopen. So um, it's according to by the, the government's orders, all the surgery are prohibited. So uh, he, you, everyone can see this is uh, my hospital. There is a tent uh, for the uh, investigator investigate of the patient's history. So um, surgery is prohibited and uh, some uh, uh, invasive examination like the UBM, laser recipe and uh, the others are also um, prohibited. I only um, can examine patient simply and give them the R drips. Uh, I can do nothing. Um, but uh, for the emergency case, we must send this patient to the, the um, special hospital. And uh, all the patient um, be permitted to enter the, our hospital must be the local status um, people. You know, in this period, in the early March and the February, the, every city of China's people is don't allow to go out of the their uh, local city. So um, this, this is uh, our staff. You can see uh, we are all uh, with the um, pro protect the cross and uh, take the glasses uh, to um, um, to see our patients. And uh, uh, everybody will want to enter the hospital must just test the body temperature and the inquire the epidemic history. He said our staff are in the tent before the uh, hospital. We must uh, test uh, the temperature and ask the where are where are you from? Uh, who, are you, who are you? We must uh, fill the questionnaire and uh, we, um, every um, patient must check the travel tracing using mobile um, apps. You know, if uh, China have the mobile service, uh, the service uh, give the apps that we can see uh, people uh, where they are and uh, where from in the two weeks. Uh, only the local Pers uh, patients that can um, allow to enter the, our hospital. Yes. So um, after uh, two weeks uh, reopen, the surgery is permitted to uh, procedure. All the patient is uh, from the, but all the patient from all from outside of Shanghai is be questioned on the, over the two weeks. It means uh, if I has the book in the surgery, the patient must uh, stay in the hotel or the uh, somewhere um, for uh, waiting for two weeks, uh, they can take the procedure. And uh, for the exam room, we can see the limit, uh, the limit, limit have the, the cover and uh, all the um, patients and uh, the doctor will take the mask. So uh, if this is a, a surgery, uh, you during surgery, you can see the doctor who take the uh, laser procedure will take the mask and uh, the, some uh, um, doctor will take the glasses to protect themselves. So uh, now uh, after maybe three months after uh, the COVID-19, the other patient, uh, the, uh, the procedure is maybe simpler, but uh, every patient must uh, steer a field questionnaire at uh, the temperature test. Uh, this is the uh, uh, normal daily work. Uh, now you can see the, our staff will maybe test the uh, temperature and uh, ask their question. Where from the total volume of the outpatients and the surgery just uh, recover about um, 50 percent than the last years. So uh, all the congress and the meetings become online like this. So we are launching many, many uh, meetings uh, on the line, like you, the every guys here. So I think maybe um, continue to the, um, maybe continue the September or October or, or the meeting can uh, reopen. So uh, here is my, the uh, experience of the uh, COVID-19 from Shanghai Air Hospital. So we are to we'll stand together. Thank you, everyone.
Thank you, Dr. Shen. It was an amazing experience that you have, guys, in, in China. I don't know, Ivo Takashi, would you like to say something about this? It's it's incredible how you handle this situation, right, in China. I would like to ask about surgery, specifically cataract surgery nowadays. How are you managing cataract surgery right now, May 5th? Uh um, the cataract surgery is the procedure is uh, like the normally, but uh, the, all the patient should be uh, takes the mask and uh, the surgeon also takes mask. Uh, and uh, the patient must uh, be questionary of the, his uh, academic history. They are, uh, where uh, did you they go to the Wuhan? Did, did you have uh, from the uh, overseas? If they come from Wuhan and uh, uh, overseas and uh, uh, some uh, dangerous uh, location, uh, they don't uh, permit to uh, take the procedure, uh, cataract surgery. We only uh, receive the patient from the Shanghai, um, you know, the local patient, we can do the surgery. But uh, the other patient from other city, we, we may be considered, yeah. Because the way, uh, in, in our group, they are, um, the uh, in Guangzhou our group, uh, the the one patient takes the laser corneal re reflex surgery. After he takes the corneal reflex surgery, we will confirm that he has get the COVID nineteen disease. So the surgery and the, the nurse who I receive this patient may be a uh, question already about uh, two weeks. Uh, yeah. Are, are so, so people? Are patients afraid of going to the, the doing surgery? Are they afraid? How many patients, old patient, cataract surgeries? Are there really how many percent are going and how many percent are not going for the for the um, for the all the patients for all patients? I think there are maybe only twenty percent or who want to go to the hospital. There are maybe. Uh, so, um, some reasons because you know the old patient is afraid of this disease, they will stay at home. And another uh, reason is because all the students, uh, like my doctor, uh, yes, must stay at home because all the school is closed now. It's not open. It's maybe open uh, the the middle school and the uh, the school and the college is not not open in China, maybe um, reopen in the later of the May. So uh, the old patient maybe stay at home uh, with this uh, child, uh, you know, so there they are no chance to go to the hospital to take the surgery. Okay, great. So we can we can move forward and we're going to see what people are, are asking. Because there's you know, Interesting question. Can I make a question, Ivo? Yeah. This is Amari. Sure. So uh, thanks for the presentation. And uh, it was very good to see that uh, even though the situation is still um, hard for the people to go back to the hospital, you already recovered 50% of the volume. So this is very good. How do you see the following months? How, how do you see that uh, it can normalize the hundred uh, percent volume in, in in your hospital. Uh, I think uh, maybe uh, recover. Uh, maybe uh, need uh, several months. Uh, maybe it's rec uh, fully recover at the September or October. You know, uh, this uh, fifty uh, percent value of surgery is due to the uh, corneal reflex surgery. The it's recover quickly. But for the cataract surgery and the the other surgery may be uh, the volume of the cyst surgery may be a steer the low. Yeah. Thank you. Good. Thanks. Very, very interesting. Uh, there's, there's a couple of questions. There is Dr. Pablo Castillo asking how many patients you are seeing per day, per session, per, you know, per doctor. No, uh, I, uh, I know um, every 
they maybe see the uh, 20, 20 patients. But uh, most of these patients is the post -op operation, you know, is here is uh, uh, revisit me and uh, check their the eyes again. But uh, there is uh, a later uh, the new patients come to my hospital. Yes. Thank you very much, doctor. So now uh, we're gonna hear the team from the infection committee from higher China. Yes, uh, Monma, Monma from uh, and Leah from medical quality control team for IR. Uh, please, uh, we can start. Can you hear us? 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 Hello? Is it better uh, now? Uh, a little bit. Hello. Hello. Hello? Hello? We can listen Hello? to you. We can listen to you, but the volume is low. Yeah. Do you have any okay, other? Okay. I'll try my best to keep my voice up. Okay. 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 Perfect. As uh, Dr. Chen has mentioned before about uh, our hospital practice in Shanghai, uh, we are going to share about the, how we're doing the protection procedures and protocols in our hospitals as an overall. Can you see the slide now? Yes. Can you put them in presentation mode so we see the entire screen? Yes. There's five aspects we're going to talk about. First, I would like to uh, have a big picture about uh, the epidemics around China. Uh, right, uh, according to the data of yesterday, we have a total case of 84,000, and 80% of them are coming from one province, one country. And this is uh, only one province, and right now, uh, the active cases in Hubei province has gone going down to zero. And together with the other 17 provinces, all together, uh, we have right now about an active case of around about 600. So there's only some cases, a few cases around the coastal cities, coastal provinces, or the north border. And this is the kinetics of as you can see from the where the number spikes at the beginning, um, part of our hospitals were closed under the request by local authorities, and part of them are open, were open only for urgent care. And in mid February, our was reopened for the services as designated eye care hospital. Okay, I think we, we need to pause for a little while. There's some problems, technical problems. There is another microphone open. So, so yeah, we're going to change it into so, yeah, another laptop. Yeah, we'll there you go. You can you can continue. Uh, okay. 
Okay. So, uh, Dr. Dr. Chen, um, you had any any doctors that had uh, COVID during this uh, six months? Yeah. Yes. Uh, it's very sad news uh, because uh, during this uh, COVID nine um, disease period, uh, there is uh, maybe three uh, of the merges that uh, has died from this disease. They are all from the Wuhan one hospital, you know. The a guy um, is very, very young. It's uh, just uh, maybe uh, near 30 years. He is famous uh, um, here in China. Everybody, every area of some regions know him. He's called uh, Wen Liang Li. And uh, his wife is also the uh, the staff of the air hospital. Yeah. Uh, it's the, the ophthalmologist that discovered the, discover the disease, right? Uh, yes, um, but uh, uh, three, the uh, three of the merger has died, but uh, uh, some of the other has recovered. For uh, now in Wuhan, they are all um, still have some uh, uh, doctor um, from uh, the you know the general um, surgery doctor is still in the um, ICU. They were still take the uh, receive the research therapy. Yes, yeah, they are still in the cover. Okay, I think they got it. Yeah. Uh, so uh, during the, uh, I see the, some guy ask question of my, if you do the uh, telemedicine in the, with patient. Yes, we do this uh, telemedicine during the, the hospital cross all uh, reopen in the early March. But uh, we did get the permission from the re, uh, regulator. Uh, I can't do any surgery. So, you know, for the some uh, emergency uh, case uh, like the glaucoma, uh, accurate glaucoma crisis, we can't take no, um, no therapy. So, I think uh, um, the patient from uh, of mine, they are the one patient with the glaucoma is a little, little high higher pressure, but he can re receive the surgery. So, uh, he maybe lost uh, his uh, um, the visual during this, uh, due to this uh, disease, you know. We're only waiting maybe uh, two months can take surgery, you, but uh, his optic nerve is the uh, atrophy, you know. Because uh, in uh, this uh, special periods, uh, only one and the two, only, yes, only one hospital in Shanghai can take the of submerged uh, um, procedure during this uh, February or the March, so um, I think it's um, it's w very uh, sadness for the patients and for other patients from uh, other diseases like uh, you know the renal um, fear failure they take the uh, therapy is uh, maybe stopped. So I think it's. Uh, so it's a bit harder period so for uh, the patients and for the doctor. Okay, I think the medical quality control, they connected again, okay? Yes, we're oh, okay now. Yes, I think okay. I will continue. Okay. Yes. okay. Uh, in the beginning of this, uh, uh, this epidemic, part of our branches were closed and part of them are opened, but only for certain, uh, urgent care. And in mid-February, our Wuhan, which is our biggest hospital and also uh, local, uh, located at the center of this outbreak in China, was reopened for services as a designated hospital from the government. And then in early March, the rest of our closed branches started to reopen one by one from urgent services to a full practice. As the protocol of our uh, outpatient, in general, we have several uh, steps. First is the volume control. We'll by asking the online appointments of non-urgent patients. And the second bit is that we provide information on our websites or the social media platform, platforms. Uh, about daily limits of appointment and visit, also the identification of emergent and non-emergent eye conditions, 
the guidance for treating regular non-urgent problems, and the personal protection before a hospital visit, and also the chronic eye diseases during this epidemic. And the last, there's information about internet hospitals for online consultation and telemedication. And we emphasize on a 24 hour entry guard, which means that all the people entering the hospitals at any time receives temperature monitoring and also the questionnaire. All the medics living the hospitals should change their mask uniform and avoid taking any medical supplies and devices out of the area. As you can see, this is a, a posters of Wuhan hospitals, which they says consultation online and emergency care offline. And patients just can scan these QR bars to get online hospital and get their online consultation easily. As an access management, we open only a dual channel entrance one for patient and the other one for staff only to effectively control the access. And we establish a checkpoints, one outside the hospital entrance and at the entrance of each service areas and function sectors. There is a primary triage that we set outside both entrance of the hospitals and masks are provided for those who didn't have it. And during the triage, we will do a, a screening of temperature checking and an inquiry of suspected COVID-19 symptoms and uh, your recent 14 day travel history in Wuhan or other countries with the severe outbreaks. And also the contact of confirmed, uh, whether there's contact of confirmed or suspected cases. And the third is that we will verify, verify of patients traveling track. There is a QR, bar of each citizens in China about their health of the 14 days is a travel trace back with a network tra tracking system. And we will set up an isolation zone that is near the triage. As you can see in the picture, there is an isolation zone and identified or suspected cases are put into immediate isolation here before they were transferring to the COVID-19 designated hospital. And we pay special attention to the entry guard at night since almost all the emergency cases are coming from that period. And this is a notification and commitment letter that we ask our patients to sign before they going into the hospital. There is a notification about the information of this epidemics. And also we're asking the patients to uh, their claimation of their information is correct and truth. Otherwise, if uh, they were uh, diagnosed of COVID-19 later on, uh, but giving us the false information or lying about their travel history, uh, he will bear the legal consequences. A at the pre uh, preliminary triage, we will categorize our patient into four kinds. One, the first one is patient with fever or having the suspected, uh, inf uh, suspected uh, symptoms of COVID-19 infection, such as shortness of breath, coughing, uh, and so on. In this case, a uh, patient will be put into the isolation zone and we will report to the prevention and control unit and contact the designated hospital to transfer patient for treatment. And after that, we will do a terminal disinfection of all contaminated areas and objects that was executed according to our standards. And the second condition is the category is that patients who have contact with COVID-19 patient or have an exposure history. And even though in this case, the patient himself doesn't have any abnormal symptoms or signs, we will ask them to be delayed for medical consultation and advise them to be self isolated at home for 14 days. And the third one is for patient with red eyes. We have a consultation uh, room, which is set closest to near the primary triage. And uh, we will ask the patients about his symptoms and uh, inform him about risk of infection 
and the, the prevention procedure of COVID-19 and advise him for a 14 day self quarantine after the consultation. And we will do a daily follow ups of the next 14 days from the hospitals. And once the patient was uh, confirmed of the infection, all the medics having been contacted with him will be quarantined also. And the last category, uh, category is the, uh, the patient excluded of these three above conditions. And these patients will go ahead with be guided for a consultation as normal. This is a flow chart of how we categorize four kind of patients and the fur further procedures. For OPD arrangement, we will continue to practice social distancing during the practice uh, in the process of screening, registration, and waiting areas. And the distance between each two person is about one meters. And we emphasize that one room with one patient only. Under special circumstances, one companion is allowed to go in. And for consultation rooms, should also be well ventilated. We will close up all the consultation rooms that has no windows and open those only, open only those consultation rooms with windows. And disinfection of the equipment shall be done after each consultation. And both the doctors and patients should wear a face mask at the same time. And uh, we will minimize the examination as far as possible and patient will be instructed in advance not to talk during his or her examination. As you can see, these are the pictures and the two pictures on the left bottom is uh, the protection level of a face-to-face -face consultation in the area of a severe outbreak. And the pictures on the right side, as you can see, the protection level of our doctors are lower. They're not wearing goggles because the hospital was located in an area that is the, the epidemic is not severe. About setups of the apartment department, as you can see, office table will be placed properly under a well ventilated area, and the doctor's seat is suggested to be in an upper wind location. As you can see here, we would just put directly uh, the sit lamp. In just in front of the door at the entrance. And the uh, protective shields will be installed on sl slit lamp and other devices, which requires doctor patient proximity. And we use tunnel PAM and eye care to replace Goldman if we need a IOP checkup. And we do not advise anyone to use an NCT, but if you need to use an NCT, you it should be placed in a well ventilated area because it creates an air puff, which can also cause a droplet transmission through the eyes. And the interval between each checkup of the NCT will be prolonged also. We avoid the use of direct and uh, thermoscopy. Uh, instead, we use a 90D lenses or an indirect one. We suspend the use of UBM confocal microscopy. ERG, VEP, and uh, OptoMap, et cetera, in a non-urgent condition. We use single-dose eye drops for pupil dilatation and topical anesthesia, and uh, we do disinfection of all the equipment surfaces also. As you can see in the picture, we use a protective film to cover the surface of a quick, frequently used objects, including mobiles, keyboards, mouse, and the uh, screen. Uh, about the intravitreal injection. Uh, intravitreal injection was postponed in most of our hospitals, which located in areas with great epidemic severity. And we ask our patients to stay home and monitor their vision with the Emsler grid daily. Uh, when the situation comes better in the, and the epidemic goes down, we will uh, do carry out this performance under extra cautions. And there is a guidelines of us for the procedures. We will limit the appointment today, uh, every day to be less than 20. And all 20 appointments will be divided into five batches. 
and no more than four patients per batch. And there is uh, also 30 minutes intervals between each of these five batches. And during the procedures, uh, we we'll keep an orderly practice of one patient waiting and one patient for disinfection in preparation room and the other one patient in treatment. And all treatment will be at a halt for a 15 minute disinfection of the overall equipment and the environment and af after every 10 injections are done. Okay, for as the protocol of inpatient, also we have an inquiry form for surgical patients as also as commanded by local authorities. We need to do a chest CT and an NAT task, blood routine, uh, blood oxygen saturation and the antibodies tested. And specialized hospitals, for example, IR, we are specialized eye hospitals. We do not operate on patients suspected of or confirmed of COVID-19. We have to transform, transform them to a designated general hospitals for COVID-19 and also they have ophthalmology department there. And there is a secondary screening at the MPD entrance, as you can see in the picture on the left side, uh, the patient's temperature and the, are checked. And there's also a query about uh, their traveling history. And during the whole uh, hospitalization, temperature and physical conditions are checked four times a day. And uh, during the severe, out, uh, severe outbreak, one ward is of, is allowed one patient only. If even though one would maybe we have two or three beds, we will only allowed one patient to uh, assign in. And one care person is allowed too. Both patients, care person and doctor nurses are wearing face mask. And no visit allowed between or among patients and, and outsiders. And protocol for surgery. We will control the number of scheduled surgery and distinguish between emergency ones and elective ones. Surgeries like cataract and ocular plastics are delayed, even in areas where the epidemic situation is not severe. And these are the emergency conditions that we are mostly done uh, with surgery, uh, including open club injuries, cubital coma, which fails to control the medication, and the perforation of the cornea, infectious endothelitis, and also retinal test and we completed COVID-19 screening before moving to surgical procedure. These are the, fo the following, uh, fo we follow the request of screening items from the local authorities. For example, a COVID-19 screening item before surgery in Wuhan is that we have a, you need to have a PCR test of the recent third three days and a lung CT scan of the recent third three days and blood routine and the oxygen saturation and also, if necessary, IgM and IgG testing. And we double check the pre-operation profile of the patients and the screening result. And if they are a result of the, the PCR test is positive, we will refer the patient to a qualified general hospitals for emergency surgery, but not at our own hospitals. This is a checklist for surgical patient. As you can see, can the, you, uh, they have. Question? Yes, yes, yes yes of course. Question. When you talk about one protocols, are the same protocols for the rest of China or they're different? Uh, it's the same. It's the same. It's the same. Yes. OK. The only uh, difference is between the uh, whether your uh, your area is uh, during a non severe outbreak or a severe one. This is the difference. The protection level of the doctors are different. Others are the same. Perfect. Okay, as you can see, uh, the protocols in OR, uh, we will avoid general anesthesia, and one OR is used at one time. For sufficient time with uh, sufficient time intervals will be left between two operations and we will turn off the laminar flow if there's uh, one OR is not only one OR is used at the same time. 
And during severe epidemics, in addition to changing operating gowns and plus protective masks for respirators, should also be replaced after each. Operation. As you can see in the picture, there's a difference. As I, I just said, that, uh, in areas of non-severe outbreak, the protection level of our doctors is lower. As on the right side, this is from Hubei province, which uh, it is the center of this outbreak. And uh, our doctor's protection level is very high. They use a hazmat suit, goggles, and uh, cover all their bodies. And uh, they will use two pair of, glass, uh, of uh, gloves. Another question. Mask? How you yes. how you catalog how you catalog a you know a, a high outbreak versus a low outbreak place? Uh, it's according to the statistics. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, it, uh, there is the map. The uh, let me go to the first page. Yes, the map here, as you can see. Here, the it is the one of our province called Hubei which takes up 80% of all the cases in China. And this is a, uh, the area of severe outbreak and the, the cities are locked down and everything is on level one protection and level one action. So all the things here was the very strong back level, protection level was high. And on, on the, the rest places, the protection level is relatively lower. Perfect, because, Perfect, because in my humble opinion, what, what, what I think it's the traveling history has been one of the most important keys to, to, to control this, this pandemic for you guys, right? Because yes, yes. they're not doing that. It's very hard to do it in Latin America, but I think for you, it's very important. And it's the thing that has, yes. that made you able to control it. Okay. Yes, we asked everyone whether they're coming from this place. Okay, I may continue. Uh, here, yes. As for hospital environment in management, we will turn off all the central con air conditioning inside the hospitals. Uh, but to make sure a good ventilation, we will open all the windows for natural ventilation. And we conduct thorough cleaning and on the devices air and objects on a daily basis according to our guidelines and the elevators will be disinfected on an hourly basis and equipped with hand sanitizer and napkin paper uh, and uh, there is also a reminder to inst uh, for instructing the pa uh, passengers to avoid direct contact with the elevator buttons and this is uh, the guideline uh, for disinfection of different uh, risk areas and also the procedures of the disinfection including ventilation, object surfaces, floors, uh, the disinfection in ward, OR and other staff members. Uh, we have a training of the anti-COVID-19 prevention and control conducted to all staffs and they everyone will report their temperature and the physical condition on a daily basis and uh, protective measures such as the cab masks gloves goggles will be taken by all personnel and we'll also emphasize hand hygiene for all the medics there's the procedure of mask changing in the clinic is that first wash your hands and then take off your mask, then wash your hands again, and then put on the new. This is a protection level, a different post, and different uh, protection equipment used. For patients, education is also very important. We have videos and tips for COVID 19 prevention and control. That's available at the website and the social media platform that is sent out to our patients. And also, patient discharge from hospitals will be followed for 15 days by phone and inquired about and physical conditions. In the case of any patient uh, confirmed with COVID 19, they will be immediately traced 
and all the medics who have been close contact with him during hospital stays will also be isolated at the same time we we'll report to the local CDCs. As uh, for reopening and resumption of our clinical work, there is also one, some sorry, procedures. I'll, yes? A quick one before you, you change. Uh, what about patient education before they get to, to the clinic? Are you doing something about that? So they know what to expect when they go to to a consultation? Yes. Yes, there's instructions on our website oh, and perfect. also our local medias about and you, you how do it to because prepare. It, it was a question from the public. You do it uh, by phone, or they just have information in the website. You do some telemedicine before the consultation or, or not? Uh, we, uh, for people uh, who's having an appointment by the phone, we will talk to them on the phone. Uh, for people who are coming, yeah, they make online appointments through our social media or our like mini program uh, apps. There will be videos showing their uh, how to like that. They need to watch that videos. Okay. Res uh, for, okay. For resumption of clinical work. First, the preparation before reopening. Uh, we set up our objectives as scientific control and prevention and orderly diagnosis and treatment and ensure a safety of the staff and patients and meeting the patient's medical needs or require. And the second is that we'll each continue to issuing guidelines for clinical reopening and also continue to updating all the guidelines. And the third that is we set up a COVID-19 prevention control unit at our top administration to formulate the prevention control procedures and emergency protocols under the government command. And the fourth is that we have operation of our entities. Uh, we assist all our, our operating systems, hospitals, or PPE uh, resources in no less than eight weeks. And the hospitals will unify the management of the use of these equipment according to different positions and different posts. And there's also training of all our staffs. And then after we finish all these above uh, procedures, we will submit a reopening application to our local health authorities. And if they approved, then we will all reopen our hospitals. And we would not open all the services at once in, but in an orderly manner. First, only urgent, uh, urgent care, now outpatient care and also the emergency service. And the third step is that uh, we first the outpatient care and the emergency surgery and also part of the uh, elective service and then the full stage is the fully practice. And the third is that we are continue to issuing and updating all the protocols from of our hospitals. And uh, as you can see here, this is a, a screenshots that uh, the clinical protocols that we have been issued during the times. Thank you. That's all what we would like to share today. Thank you very much. It was very informative. Uh, seriously, there's so, so much information there. I just have one, um, probably there is another question, but I have a one quick one. I saw that some colleagues were doing the um, consultation with the slit lamp outside the room. Just the, the patient will come and they were in the door. That's for all consultations or just some? Uh... That's for uh, in the only in the locations where in Hubei province, because we need to make sure that the consultation or they do in a well ventilated areas. That's why. But in Correct. other hospitals, we don't do it outside. Okay, and the last one, I'm sure Amari, it's 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 thinking about this too. Is if you're doing all those tests before surgery, the price of surgery. Is, it became really high now, right? Yes. I mean, you need to test them a lot to do to perform surgery. Uh, we, no, we, we don't test them. They go, they to they get the tests from a designated hospital or an oh, institute. Okay. Yes, and then get, they give us back the report. Okay, but the patient needs to pay it. Uh, yeah, yeah. 
Uh, no, no, no. During COVID-19, uh, the test is free. Oh. Yes, the test is free. Government pays. Okay. I have a question about telemedicine. Uh, there is a Harvard study that shows that just only 30% of the patients will migrate to telemedicine. So what is, what is your experience about it, if you have that number? Uh, right now, we don't have the number, but I think this epidemic has pushed forward our online appointment and online internet hospitals mm -hmm. of huge step. And I think patients, yes, uh, most of the patients, they come naturally walk in before the epidemics. And during these epidemics, and as also we are advocating uh, them to move to the internet for online consultation appointments, the patients are, uh, yes, they're very complying with this. Are you uh, having no, a good answer? I don't have data. Okay, but do you think that you, are you having a good answer for your patient, they are having, or they are getting involved with telemedicine. What is, how is the population in China about that? Uh, I, I'm not sure how much or how many percentage, but all the hospitals during these epidemics are moving, uh, are trying to moving them to the internet. Okay. And the last one about it, because there are a lot of people asking about it. Uh, did you have the the software of telemedicine before the pandemic, or you just release uh, a software for this situation? Uh, we have it developed last uh, last year before the epidemics. We are using it but not in all our hospitals, in some of our hospitals. But okay. during these epidemics, a lot of uh, more hospitals are applying to use this mini program. And now we're still, I think uh, we have more than 100 uh, hospitals that are using this online. And uh, by the end of this month or next month, it will be reached to uh, 200. There is a very good question from the public, maybe for Dr. Dr. Chen or for you. And they're asking, which was the main difficulty, the most important one? coming back to consults and to surgery, in your opinion. Dr. Chen, I think you yeah. have more experience. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, the most uh, difference between, uh, before and after this is COVID-19, uh, we must uh, um, question on the patient's travel sure. history and uh, uh, they are do the PCR test, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, the mm -hmm. doctor maybe um, protect um, their same, their self by the uh, face mask and the goggles. Mm. Mm. This is the uh, difference. Yeah, uh, because uh, you know in Shanghai and Beijing, um, CCT the COVID now is not severe like the Hubei and Wuhan. Yeah. Perfect. So for matters of time, let's go to, to talk to Amari and to Jonathan. It, it was great to have you. Thank you so much. Just a, a, a little a last note. Uh, it will be great if you are able to give us some kind of contact or link. So if we have other questions and you know there's a lot of people with very interesting questions, that would be great. Thank you very much for your time. Yes, I think Chloe will Welcome. give you a link later. Thank you very, very much. Stay safe. You're welcome. Thank you. It, it was, it, it's going to be a lot of help for so many people. So from Latin, the entire Latin America, we thank you for, for all the information. Thank you. I'm already. Sure. Thank you. If, if, before I start, it's just to make a comment on the test that you, you mentioned about increasing the costs of the surgery if we provide this test, which in Latin America is not free, right? Um, or the patient has to pay or we have to pay. We are about to start, I was discussing with uh, Jonathan Takash to do this test uh, with our uh, patients that are planned to do the surgery on our costs. We think uh, in the case of Brazil is about uh, $40 for zero. 
we think that uh, is is very important for us to to have this surgery done in a safe way. So we are going to provide this at our cost. Okay, can you hear me guys? Yes, perfectly, you can start. Okay, let's go. So first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. It's amazing, Ivo, Andrea, what we are doing through the, through the Ophthalmo University, engaging the ophthalmology community in Latin America, all the education programs, and uh, it's uh, a proof that we have today. It was amazing to learn from our year experience. We understand that uh, they are ahead of us in this very unfortunate and unexpected situation. So it's amazing to learn uh, how the, all the details and uh, what we are going to do now. I'm gonna start with a brief introduction about our group and, this, and then I hand over to, to Dr. Jonathan and also to Dr. Takashi to talk a little bit of what we are doing uh, related to the COVID-19 and also uh, our medical innovation capabilities that we are using, especially now in this challenging situation. So the Opti Group today is the largest ophthalmology group in, in Latin America. And uh, we started, can, can you uh, go ahead? We started our operations about four years, uh, um, four years ago. So we are one of the companies that the main shareholder is a private equity fund called Patria. Patria is a Brazilian private equity fund. Um, as a private equity is the largest in Latin America. And Patria has investments in several sectors of the economy and healthcare is the main pillar of investments for Patria. So during more than 30 years, Patra has become an expert in the healthcare arena and uh, with so many companies that you can see in this, in this slide. In healthcare that uh, we have distributors, we have uh, pharmacies, we have uh, 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 hospitals, we have uh, in our case, the, the Opti is a uh, eye care chain. We have a uh, diagnostics companies, always with the same model. The model is an associative model which means that um, Patria, along with a successful ophthalmologist, uh, decided to, to make an association to become partners and be part of a big group, which in the case is Opti, which I, I am the CEO, so I, I run that. So we put the, 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 uh, both uh, expertise together. The medical strategy that uh, the doctors and the founders of the clinics created in a, a professional way to manage the operations of these hospitals. This is in a, in a few words, what Patra has been done. And I, if you go to the next slide, uh, Jonathan, what uh, we've been done on this regard during the last four years is this um, storyline. So we started in 2016, Dr. Takashi, which is one of the main shareholders of Opti, uh, it started uh, with uh, the, his group, the HOB in Brasilia, and then we gained traction and we start to have a very successful expansion in Brazil. And, uh, and if you go to the next one, please, Jonathan, we have today 40 uh, clinics and hospitals, and hospitals around the country. So that was very good that uh, we gain, uh, we spread out in all the regions of Brazil, and that this uh, we gain we gain lots of uh, uh, um, power um, when uh, we negotiated with the the AGMOs, for instance, with the insurance companies. So they need us uh, as a group, and uh, we equilibrate a lot our our negotiation with them. So that's some numbers that we have here on the right side. So it's about 40 units. We, we, we have around uh, 1,800 employees 
600 ophthalmologists. Our revenues are uh, about uh, $100 million. We do more than 2 million procedures in total. And then you can see some numbers on uh, cataracts, on, on retina, on refractive. And, uh, and uh, just to have an idea of the, the size of our group today. The next one, please. So Latin America, I saw many friends connected today. So it's very nice to see you guys and miss you a lot. So our plans is to replicate the, the strategy that we are doing in Brazil in Latin America. So myself, uh, I, I myself and especially Takashi, we made an assessment uh, to all the countries and uh, our plans is to start the operations this year. And I can tell you that uh, even though we have this unfortunate surprise on COVID-19, the plans of Opti for growth, expansion, go to Latin America. And also we are in the, in the way like uh, IER did to our IPO, it doesn't, it doesn't change. So we continue with the same strategy, the same vision as to become this big group in Latin America to go to other countries and to make an IPO soon. Please, Jonathan. Mauri. Sure. Let me ask you a quick question because here in Aftoma University, we are all the time talking about teamwork. And, and, you know, and making a team and I see you, you have the spoken hub model and I, I'm in love with it. What are the three things you will tell other colleagues that are the main uh, reasons they should, you know, become part of a big group so they can, you know, uh, have a better practice? Sure. Uh, what do we see from our uh, um, partners today are some, um, some uh, wishes, right? One is expansion. It's like I have my clinic today and I, I, I want to spread out. So expansion is one of the, the, key, um, the key things that we can do. We have the capital and we have a, a specialized group to do this in a fast way. So one is expansion. The other one is to concentrate on the, on the practice because many of uh, you guys, you built a company and continue to be the main surgeon of this company and, uh, and continue to study a lot and, and get education on that. So, and uh, many of you are tired of dealing with the back office activities, with personnel, with taxes, with uh, profitability and all of that. So. We have a very specialized group that uh, manages all this practice management, administrative, and all of that. And the other one, let's let's be honest, uh, you work a lot, and uh, you you should be focused on making your companies or your clinics and hospitals more profitable. So when we put a group together, we are able, for instance, to acquire equipment, to have a negotiation with. Uh, with uh, our partners at Alcon, Johnson, Zeiss, and all other companies, much better. So we can buy much better. We also, what we do, we built a shared services um, um, office. So what we do, we bring all the back office activities that all of you has, have in your facilities, like a accountant, a legal, um, and all the HR related to the payroll and all of these transactions that uh, they have to be very well done, but really doesn't value added to the hospital itself. So we concentrate the core business in the hospitals and we bring to only one place all these back office activities. And this relates to synergy and to, and to better management of the costs and we can grow faster with a better profitability. Maybe I'm listing three of them. No, but, but I really like it. Especially, I think so, something that it's really hard for us to understand is that you know we, we have certain amount of hours and certain amount of energy per day, right? 
And you know, we, we can do it, everything. We can be the accountant and the doctor and the surgeon and you know, pay the taxes. So, so to, to, to make a, 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 a team, but, but with different specialties, as sometimes it's good for us. You know, we're better together. Thank you. Excellent. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for the question. And there, there was, I brought this slide because I think we all have to have a big reflection. This, I received it through the WhatsApp group. And then I, I, I search a bit to see if it was real, not fake. And uh, this, this data comes from this American Medical Association. So as you can see, we have a big challenge on all the medical specialties. Ophthalmology is the one that is suffering more on this situation. So back to our question, Ivo, in our case, uh, it, it is tough. We are also having a, a big decrease on the volume. In our case, is about in 70% of a decrease in our volume this month, this last month, which was April. But we are in a big group with a private equity company behind us. So uh, we are not uh, ban bankrupt, right? And, uh, and uh, it is a very tough situation, not only for the clinics, not all of the for many of, of other um, uh, business in other sectors are really in a difficult situation on the cash flow, how to pay the bills, even the doctors, even you as a doctor that receives uh, as a production, as a surgery, it is a very depression moment that uh, we as a group can help, right? But this is a reflection and I'm gonna hand over to Jonathan because he's, he's going to show what we are doing on this situation so challenging now. Please, Jonathan. Thanks, Amaury. I would like to start just with a small message in, in Spanish here, and then I'll go back right to the presentation, just repeat what I said. Muy importante tu evento ahora, y Andrés, Oftamo University es increíble, y las preguntas son increíbles, y son muy importantes. Y preguntaste a Amaury, ¿por qué un grupo como este? Y viste que Brasil es inmenso, Latinoamérica es inmenso y somos todos hermanos. Tenemos la barrera del idioma, como decís, pero yo creo que ahora es el momento de su pasarla. En Brasil, eh, nos dio la oportunidad de una unión en que hablamos hace 30 años. Los médicos no se unen, pero eso es, eso es una, una oportunidad muy grande. Y eso pasa por dos cosas que tienen a ver con Stanford University, que son innovation in la education. So I was mentioning here how Brazil is enormous and Latin America is even bigger. We have a, a language barrier that can be surpassed. There's a lot of similarities, but we're all in this together. The countries are very similar and are going through a very uh, similar moment. And being in a group like this, we're able to finally, after decades of conversations, unite uh, the medical society as best as possible. So we're, we're 500, uh, specialists that are able to talk throughout the whole country and this has helped us a lot and I think the mainstays with all the support that we have from administration is through education and innovation and this has always been a part of Opti before this whole crisis. So uh, one of you asked did we have the tools and techniques for telemedicine and implementation of all the technologies we were working on it and working on proof of concepts and we had to push further right now. So this is from before. This is an old uh, slide that has to be updated, but it's basically, and we have our head of innovation, which is Renan Oliveira, which is a brilliant guy, 30 years old, went to Harvard, MIT, has a bunch of software projects, and he's just pushing us forward through a lot of these in innovative projects here. And the whole idea here is to promote disruption in order to innovate. So here, this is a bigger slide, but we're organizing a hub. We have entrepreneur uh, new program. We have a uh, hack vision at the end of the year. We want to invite all of you to show up over there, including Aya. This is going to be very important for us to share new technologies in order to progress. So we are moving to digital health and to the e-patient experience. And what was unbelievable, this whole thing that happened just a month and a half ago that really has pushed us forward. 
we're at a different situation now than we than in China. Uh, we have surpassed the number of cases, so we have 114,000 cases. They're distributed very unevenly here to Brazil. We have a very large hotspot here in Sao Paulo. And the problem with the other areas is that, as and that's a problem with Latin America, we have uh, we don't have enough respirators or healthcare professionals in several areas. We do have it in Sao Paulo, but then the biggest tragedies are where we are, we're not well equipped. And here we see the curve and right now in May, this is May 5th, we don't know if the curve is going to be stable, if it will go down, or if it will go up. So May will be a crucial month for us where we really kept an eye on it. So we're talking about education, innovation, and all the, the corporate protection that we get from the company. One of the main reasons, because as an ophthalmologist, technology is extremely expensive. For us Latin Americans, it's even more expensive because of all the dollar, dollar parity. And in a group like this, you have access to that. Uh, so you're protected. And with this crisis, this protection was even, was even higher. So right here on March 12th, right in the beginning, not very many cases was a day where we're following the best practices. And we had that in Takashi and I are doing, we did postgraduate, postdoctorate over in Harvard. And we did study pandemics and crisis and both Opti and Patra instituted immediately the crisis committees. So we have a, here our Diego, our chief operations officer, uh, myself, Liziani, which has been crucial because she's human resources, our strategy officer, Juliana, all led by Amaury. So this was, we've been uh, getting together every single day, eight in the morning, discussing all the programs. In two days, we already came, I'm sorry for the Portuguese here, but this is a contingency plan for the COVID-19. This was developed in two days by the whole team. And basically, I'm going to translate this here. We had to revise all emergency plans. So this came both from within, from all our, from our whole team, and also from Patria. So we have constant feedback from several meetings, several committees helping us with this whole crisis. Uh, train, after this, in two days, in five days, we trained all the leaders throughout the whole country. So this was very important. And we were able to begin communication. And this is the biggest challenge in, in a very short time. So I would say uh, during the crisis, it was very hard to deal with the surge of deaths and all the information we're getting from abroad. But in a very uh, small span of time, we were able to prepare the whole group. And this, to me, was very valuable. We have several ongoing projects that are going on. Uh, one of them, which is extremely important, was the institution of the medical affairs. We, being an associative group, we associated to different brands and we wish to keep the local characteristics. And medical affairs has united uh, this in one whole pillar. Our chairman now is uh, Takashi, which is here watching us. And the whole idea is to promote a great integration with the whole corporation. So with the exchange between both of these, we can make a, we can become a much stronger group. So what as a group have we started implementing? And I would like to thank Ayer because you were crucial. Takashi has led several uh, meetings with uh, Baviera, Isaac, Ayer. Right now, he has been leading us towards this. And the information that you have provided for us has been uh, very, very important. So as a group, I split the measures uh, according to who would benefit more. So as a group, as a financial group, most important part was protection of the cash reserve, because without the cash reserve, and we see a lot of clinics going through this, uh, clinics that are either in debt or don't have controls or financial controls, and it'll be very hard to support the clinic throughout the next months. This was the main uh, procedure in the beginning, and this was done by several maneuvers, both from within Opti using our own our own team, but also from Patria. And Patria has several contingency uh, uh, reserves for any kind of emergencies. In three days, best to worst case scenarios, and each of these scenarios was simulated with countermeasures. So this is a very this was a very important tool for us from the information that we're getting outside the whole financial and uh, projects team were setting up these scenarios and we still uh, making adjustments from all the information we're getting from outside. We still use these as a basis for ourselves. 
personnel control. This was a very big challenge because in Brazil we have a very severe, a very complex legislation, but we have a, a big team to deal with this. So we were able to try not uh, um, really hurt most of our personnel, but we tried to keep them uh, well within control in order to protect uh, uh, our finances. We were able, this is very important as a group, this was incredible and this can I think can only be done as a group a renegotiation nationwide and all of our units regarding rentals because this eats at our uh, at our cash reserve and procure, per, procurement in which we were able to renegotiate several prices we were able to um, uh, several of the payments we, we were able to move forward and this was extremely important and to me, it was crucial. Our benchmarking these past two weeks have been incredible with Ayat, Isaac, Baviera, the information, because you guys are several weeks ahead of us, the information you've been feeding us has been extremely important. So these are the main measures as a group. For the patients, so you made a beautiful presentation. I have to say we copy everything you guys have been doing. So we implemented nationwide the ultra safe protocol for all our patients that follows everything that you presented today. We have been implementing telemedicine. We use several uh, platforms. We have developed also a virtual office that will be starting now this week in which we're, uh, we have to forward our testing of virtual uh, self-serving ophthalmology examinations and we can examine the data and hopefully uh, produce uh, better treatments for our patients. This also leads to inclusion programs, programs for uninsured because unemployment will raise a lot. Insurance will have to will be going through a major change. So we are preparing programs. We wish at the company to innovate and also include. We have a nationwide call center that attends the whole group, also with customer relation management techniques and digital marketing. We try to, with the big challenges that Amaury presented, we try to bring the best towards the patient and, and bring them back to us under the best, under uh, the big, uh, the most safety that is possible to achieve in this situation. And for us, for doctors, we have also provided several types of safety nets. So with this whole collection of information that we've been giving, we've been including the partners and also the rest of the uh, clinical infrastructure. We've been providing the infrastructure for a controlled return to work. This is very complex, but we have, this is very mutual. This involves participation of everybody. As I mentioned, telemedicine is a challenge on the side of the patient because we have elderly patients that are not used to technology, but it is also a challenge on the doctors. So we're training, we're starting uh, uh, implementing our proof of concepts and then uh, bringing up and increasing the teams of uh, doctors that are willing to use telemedicine. Uh, as I said, cash reserve is very important for the company. Not all uh, professionals are prepared. Everybody was caught by surprise. So we also have low interest loan models for our physicians based on their future earnings. So they can provide for uh, any kind of reserve right now. This is very important for our, uh, for our doctors. And this has been, I think, one of the great things that Opti and Patra have provided for us. And this was something very special and very exclusive for our group. But not only are we helping the doctors within our group, but we try to help as much as possible the doctors out of our group, providing the same infrastructure for partners that are willing to use our dependencies as a co-working model. So co-working model is something that is beginning. It was implemented in several places under different models, but we're trying to actually bring the co-working, which is well accepted in technology uh, and many, many other fields to medicine. I think it will be a great success. We have a partnership program. Uh, we have the founding partners, but it's very important to have a cohesive clinical group that we have that they eventually become and become partners of this. So we're reinforcing this. This has not been abandoned and has been very important for all of us, especially during this crisis. And the whole idea here is providing a sustainable model. So I feel very confident now inside the group that we'll be able to continue and take off after this whole crisis. Whereas uh, I wouldn't feel the same type of confidence in, in the much smaller groups I have participated. So we're trying to help everybody within and without. And we're really looking forward to this exchange with all the countries here, with our brothers here in Latin America and over throughout the ocean, throughout the whole world. Thank you very much, guys. 
Obrigado, gracias. Xie, xie. I hope I didn't <laughs> pronounce That's this Jonathan. horribly. Obrigado. Obrigado. <laughs> Amazing presentation, Jonathan. Uh, and since you're still here, since you, Omari, Takashi, and your group, it's here, I would like to ask, you know, I'm sure many of the colleagues here are, they have the, their private practice, they're scared, they're thinking about the future. So uh, what would you think will be the keys to success in order to, you know, to prepare ourselves for this new reality that it's gonna come? It's gonna take time, right? I think you, you guys said it pretty good that it, 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 being part of a team is gonna be uh, better the, the ones who are alone, what do you think are the key elements for there so that they can have success in the future? I, I can start. Um, I'll divide in two. One is very financial, a very financial answer. You need to protect your cash, your, your cash flow. Um, and the way to protect that is to renegotiate all your fixed costs. And I'm, uh, Jonathan mentioned about rental and fixed costs and taxes. And also the, 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 the big uh, efforts that we have to acquire equipment and all of that. So it's a, it's a moment that the whole chain has to understand what's going on. And the ones who does this protection of cash faster and better are going to be able to think better for the following months. So one is cash. The second one, I believe you need to find a way to bring your patients back sooner. So several of uh, things that I saw from IR and from us is to tell the patients or even to the doctors who works in our groups, come back, here is safe. It's not easy. We need to do this. And, and a way to do this regarding the doctors itself, I can put my whole call center, which in our case, we have 300 people in our call center doing the, the, all the, the appointments and all of that, to call the doctors. But they don't have the power that you guys as a doctor has to call a patient and say, here is Dr. Benati, come back. I need to see you, it's very important they will come back. So those are main two points that I, I want to share with you. Very nice, very nice. What about the IR group? What do you guys think are the keys to success? You, you guys that you have advantage, three or four months in advantage. Uh, Sorry, uh, I'm oh, hi everyone. Now, uh, maybe... Hi, this is Chloe. Uh, I'm from IR Global Strategy, and uh, it's an honor to be here today. And they're talking about the uh, success after the another you know, recovery. I would like to share a slide with you. I. Let's see, will you okay, ask so, the right person? Chloe knows everything about that. I'm not going to go from my... here. I'm learning so yeah, much. Yeah. I'm going to stay here until the end of times. Please. Yeah, I, yeah I'd like to first like to turn my question to the team uh, At the very beginning of the operation in China, we have been closely collaborated with Takashi, and the U group has donated you know, the most necessary So it has been a lot of help to our medical staff at the front line uh, in January and February. So I, I couldn't see how much I appreciate for that. And the, uh, even during this whole, you know, the whole outbreak, uh, Takashi has been you know, closely collaborated with us. And I also asked her about the opinion on the protocol. So this, this is really a very good example of uh, international collaboration. I know you are about to get back to work and get back to business. 
So I'd like to share some of my ideas. So I think we have to keep the confidence in the market because it's a high and rigid demand there. So it's, just, it's a very great potential. So, but how to, how to achieve this, you know, the success and the to uh, realize this potential, we, I think it's just two point, two part, part is very important. Firstly, is the safety. So the safety is the, how to, you know, control the medical quality. Uh, with a well-designed and flexible, you know, the clinical protocol, we can help to protect our medical staff as well as the patient. And also it's a very important to deliver a message to our patients so they will be comfortable coming back to our clinic. And also I think it's uh, very important to have, uh, you know, the planning. So it's, a, it's, it's going to be a step-by-step -step recovery. So at the very beginning, you may only have a few you know, cases coming. And it is, I think it is good because you can monitor this whole process and to see if there is any flaws or any, anything, any, any improvement during this process. And also we have to always think uh, innovations can always help us during this very fast changing environment. So I think in in the end we will you know you know get over this, but uh, share ideas and our knowledge together is also a very important part of that. So this is my idea, and I want to share with you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I really wow. liked it. You know, very summarized and very very direct and focused. I have a quick question for you guys about investments. What about if I have to make an investment, like an, a new OCT, a new excimer laser, what would you recommend? We have to wait three months, six months. What do you think? Because on the other side, the industry and the companies are having very difficult times also. Maybe in the future, we can get uh, better prices, better deals. Yeah. Good question. Yes. The, the way that I see, and uh, as you know, my long tenure uh, <laughs> in the industry, right? And I, I've been talking this with our friends, and some of them I, I, are listening to us. So I, I received some, uh, some uh, message here. It's, it's this way it's like uh, go to, the, to our partners and say, look, we both need these patients to come back sooner mm. in order to get the volume back. So let's do things differently. So for instance, if you provide me a better price on a premium IOL and I transfer this better price to the patient itself, we can, we can have a success together. It's like sharing uh, efforts mm -hmm. to get this patient together. For in this case, which is out of pocket, in, in, in many countries are, are not covered, is it is important for this recovery. So this is one comment on your question, Andre, that we can do because the other one is going to be hard. For instance, let's say that uh, we have a good laser today, refractive, eczema. It really is not a good time to, to update it, right? Because of the cash. <laughs> so it's a tricky situation that we have to prioritize, which impacts more in a short term, not losing the long term. Yeah. So it's very nice, it's very hard to execute, but uh, <laughs> we have to focus on it. <laughs> okay. uh. <laughs> I would say yeah. the, the, the problem is cash reserves, and that is the priority. It's, it's something that you have to be reminded of constantly. So I say that because when you kind of have a comeback, you have to be aware of the equipment, you have to be aware of the people, and you want to all of a sudden come do everything all at once. That said, depending on what you have and your cash reserve, now is a very good time to negotiate equipment and maybe uh, plan a payment for in six months or something because we have people that have devices, seven, 10 devices of 
high complexity that are very expensive that are just sitting around. So this is the time to maybe start payments in six months and you know get it earlier. I think uh, negotiation wise, it, it's a lot easier. Now we finally have maybe the upper hand. I don't know, Maori, because you have both sides. We haven't done that. We're really holding back on expenses now in the beginning. But I mean, depending on what you have, as long as you don't, because the main problem with a lot of the clinics, a lot of the professionals that we've been seeing is that all of a sudden they come into a pandemic in debt because they, of course you have to buy equipment to generate, uh, to generate revenue. But the problem is if you get in debt to get all the equipment and then basically all your revenue is, is eaten up by the debt that you have. So that's another, that's another wrong way. I don't know if that's very clear, but no, absolutely. keep an eye open for opportunities. The other thing is that we don't know the future, right? The new scenario, I mean, it's going to be totally different in three months, at least in Argentina, right? <laughs> you know, our country. Yeah. <laughs> so, complicated. Decision. We're in the same boat, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, so, you know, uh, this has been amazing. We have been one hour and 30 minutes. And I would love to have everybody who is still here with us, you know, to commit for a second volume in, in the future, probably one month. I want to thank also Alcon, who was very kind to, to make this happen in many ways. It helped us big time, so we want to thank them. We want to thank our group and, and all the team. They were clear. They gave us a lot of resources, a lot of uh, tips to what to do. We want to thank, you know, uh, Jonathan, Amari, and Takashi. They were very kind also to share a lot of knowledge and all, all what they're doing in, in Brazil. So I, I want to thank everybody. Uh, good night here in Latin America. Good day to China and all the higher um, team. And please, we will love to have you back. You know, and now that we did the first one to do a second one with more specific things, I think we'll be very happy. And people are very, very thankful for, for all the information we share with them. So thank you very much for your time, guys. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye bye.